Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to CompuGen's first quarter 2021 result conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. An audio webcast of this call is available in the investor section of CompuGen's website at www.cgen.com. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. With us from CompuGen are Dr. Anat Cohen-Dayag, Ari Krashen, CFO and COO, and Dr. Henry Attaway, Chief Medical Officer, who will be available for questions at the end of the call. Before we begin, I would like to read the following regarding forward-looking statements. During the course of this conference call, the company may make projections or other forward-looking statements regarding future events or future business outlook, our development efforts and their outcome, our discovery platform, anticipated progress, and timeline for our programs, financial and accounting related matters, as well as statements regarding our cash position. We wish to caution you that such statements reflect only on the company's current expectations and that actual events or results may differ materially. You are kindly referred to the risk factors and cautionary language contained in the documents the company filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including the company's most recent annual report on Form 20F filed on February 25, 2021. The company undertakes no obligation to update projections or forward-looking statements in the future. I would now turn over the call to Anat. Anat? Thank you, Operator. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our first quarter 2021 Corporate and Financial Update. We have started 2021 from a strong position, building on our timely execution for our 2020 guidance and plans. We believe 2021 is supposed to be an important year for Compugen as we continue our efforts to build a robust clinical pipeline with multiple clinical studies, while further deepen the scientific foundation for our differentiated programs. We have developed a comprehensive clinical development program designed to systematically elucidate the role of our internally discovered and wholly owned anti-PVRIG and TIGIT assets across settings and combination regimens. With steady execution, we have made great progress, both clinically and research-wise, in understanding the role of the Dynamaxis members, PVRIG and TIGIT, as potentially foundational immunotherapy checkpoint targets. Our work has identified PVRIG and TIGIT as key parallel and complementary inhibitory pathways in the DINAM axis, which also intersects with the well-established PD-1 pathway. Together, our data suggests that these three pa inhibitory pathways have different dominance in different tumor types and patients, which means that in order to induce effective anti-tumor responses, certain patient populations may require the blockade of different combinations of these three pathways. With this in mind, we have established a science-driven and data-informed clinical program which evaluates different combinations of these axis members across indications that we believe will be most relevant in the clinic. On our last call, we shared data from the combination arm of the phase one dose escalation study of COM701 in combination with Bristol-Myers-Squibbs-Nivolumab, as well as follow-up data from our monotherapy dose escalation and cohort expansion study. For the combination arm dose escalation, we provided complete data from all five dose levels in the study. Our encouraging results showed a disease control rate of approximately 67%, which is a significant accomplishment given the highly refractory, heavily pretreated, and advanced disease patient population. Equally important, 
are the observed durable responses in multiple patients and across indications, which include patients with complete and partial responses with patients on study treatment for almost a year or in some cases for more than a year. An additional meaningful highlight from these updated data relates to the patient with a complete response who prior to being enrolled in our study had disease progression on a checkpoint inhibitor. This data suggests that dual blockade of PVRIG and PD-1 may be key to driving anti-tumor immune responses in certain patient populations. These readouts are particularly significant given our latest announcement of our expanded clinical collaboration with Bristol Mass Quib to initiate a phase 1B dual combination expenses study of COM701 in combination with nivolumab, which is expected to begin in the second quarter of 2021. This study will enroll patients with ovarian, breast, endometrial, and microsatellite stable colorectal cancer and is an important addition to our clinical strategy, expanding the potential reach of this combination regimen while also providing insight towards the contribution of the different components of the DINAM axis across our ongoing and future COM701 studies and specifically our ongoing triplet study of COM701 with nivolumab and bristol myers squibs TGT inhibitor. We also shared initial data from our COM701 monotherapy cohort expansion, a safety and tolerability study with a biomarker-informed strategy to select two more types most likely to respond to treatment based on preclinical expression data and clinical results from the dose escalation arm. These indications are endometrial, breast, ovarian, colorectal, and non-small cell lung cancer. Enrollment of 20 patients in the study was completed in the fourth quarter of 2022. As of the data cutoff date we presented last quarter, six out of 20 patients had the best response of stable disease across endometrial, non-small cell lung, and ovarian cancer, and two patients with durable anti-tumor activity continuing on treatment. These data, combined with our COM701 dose escalation data, provide signals of anti-tumor activity in a monotherapy setting in tumor types typically unresponsive to immune checkpoint inhibitors. In addition, some of these single agent signals are durable, including a patient with a confirmed partial response from the dose escalation study on treatment for over one year as of the data cutoff date presented last quarter. It should be noted that these were highly refractory patients who exhausted all treatment options with tumor types that are typically non-responsive to checkpoint inhibitors, including patients with prior progression on these treatments, which together suggest that PVRIG blockade may be an important untapped checkpoint that has the potential of driving anti-tumor immune responses. The clinical data across the combination and monotherapy arms leaves us increasingly confident in our prediction that there are certain patient populations which are likely to respond to PVRIG blockers and or PVRIG and PD-1 dual blockade, including those that have progressed on immune checkpoint blockers. Another angle to evaluate the activity of COM701 is the data analysis in progress from the COM701 monotherapy cohort expansion study that will include correlative assessments based on data from patient samples, including cytokines, 
immune phenotyping, and immunohistochemistry analysis. This data that will also be gathered from our dual and triple combination studies will enable us to gain insights relating to COM701 and PVRIG PVRL2 pathway biology, particularly in indications that are typically not responsive to PD1 blockade. Our initial assessment of patients' peripheral blood samples suggests that COM701 may enhance immune activation in cancer patients alone or in combination with nivolumab. These results provide for the first time an indication for the potential effect of PVRIG blockade in peripheral blood of cancer patients treated with COM701. We are excited to be providing updated data from the COM701 monotherapy and combination with nivolumab studies in our upcoming oral presentation at ASCO on June 7, 2021, and look forward to sharing the data following our oral presentation. We continue to invest in our clinical programs and have expanded our clinical strategy to include multiple clinical studies in order to maintain our leadership position in the evaluation of the DINAM axis pathway. Moving forward in 2021, we expect to continue to execute across our broad clinical strategy, which includes the ongoing triplet study of COM701 with nivolumab and bristol myers squibs TGT inhibitor, the initiation of the doublet expansion study of COM701 with nivolumab in the second quarter of 2021, the ongoing dose escalation of COM902, our wholly owned TGT inhibitor, and following the completion of the COM902 dose escalation, the initiation of the doublet study of COM701 and COM902 in the second half of this year. With these studies in place, we are positioned to rapidly generate multiple data readouts that will be key for our development of DINAM axis based new cancer immunotherapies. Our phase 1 2 triple combination study evaluating the safety, tolerability, and preliminary anti tumor activity of COM701 in combination with Bristol Mare Squibb's TGIT antibody and nivolumab is currently enrolling patients and we expect to share initial data from the dose escalation portion of the study in the fourth quarter of this year. The purpose of this study is to allow the testing of our triple blockade hypothesis that blocking the three intersecting PVRIG, TIGIT, and PD-1 pathways has the potential to synergistically enhance anti-tumor immune responses in selected patient populations not responsive or refractory to PD-1 blockers. Another ongoing trial, the COM902 monotherapy dose escalation study, is an important component of Compigen's overall strategy. We have seen the growing interest in TIGIT inhibitors, which now include multiple clinical stage programs and we're closely following the development in this space. We firmly believe it is important to pursue the development of our own candidate to maintain our control of what we believe are two key arms of the DINAM axis and our ability to independently evaluate multiple combination approaches, which includes TIGIT in the clinic. Advancing COM902 through dose escalation and future combination studies is important for our position in the PVRIG TIGIT space. We expect to provide initial data from the COM902 dose escalation study in the fourth quarter of this year 
and are on track to begin studies evaluating COM701 in combination with COM902 in the second half of this year. The preclinical data we published in Cancer Immunology Immunotherapy strengthen our confidence in our clinical approach, providing important information on the underlying biology of TIGIT and its potential synergies with other immune checkpoints, which we can leverage in our clinical strategy. This data, together with our internal PDRIG research, allows us to focus and refine the indications we will pursue in the clinic to potentially maximize the probability of success of our combination strategy of COM701 and COM902. In addition, our research further demonstrates the absence of T cell depletion activity in vitro and in vivo with COM902 and therefore reinforces our COM902 approach which was designed to have reduced FC receptor engagement to avoid potential depletion of TIGIT expressing effector T cells. As you can see from our various scientific publications, we continue to invest in high quality in-house research that feed our clinical pipeline strategy in order to keep it differentiated and competitive. Our progress from target discovery, validation, and preclinical development, now through to a comprehensive clinical program, has been remarkable. Our discovery of the previously unknown PVRIG pathway uncovered this immune oncology pathway, and our research and clinical work have supported our position as leaders in the DINAM axis space which has been highlighted by our status as the only company with wholly owned clinical stage assets targeting both PVRG and TIGIT, and thus the only company currently capable of evaluating in the clinic PVRG monotherapy, dual blockade of PVRG with PD-1 or TIGIT, and triple blockade of PVRG with PD-1 and TIGIT. We're highly enthusiastic about what's to come later in the year. Most importantly, initial data from our dose escalation triple combination study. Our phase one, two triple combination study designed as a study in ovarian and endometrial cancers and additional tumor types with high PVRL2 expression is the ultimate test of our hypothesis and a true differentiator in the crowded immune oncology space. Beyond this exciting clinical progress, we're also continually driving forward our science, which has been the foundation that underlies our clinical progress. Our recent publications in cancer immun immunology immunotherapy and cancer discovery are testament to our scientific rigor and broader contributions to the fundamental biology of the DINAM axis. We will continue our efforts to drive the science forward, building upon our deep scientific heritage that we believe plays an integral role in our potential success. A key factor in driving our science forward involves the advancement of our early stage pipeline with multiple programs targeting the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, including targeting the myeloid population, which we believe will fuel long-term growth and opportunity for competition. The expansion of our fruit fruitful research collaboration with John Hopkins University to include focused research on a competent discovered novel myeloid target reinforces our ability to further discover completely new drug targets and our continued focused research and development on early stage programs along our clinical development execution. We're proud to continue this long-standing collaboration 
addressing our multiple drug candidates with Dr. Drupal Doll, who played an important role in the preclinical development of COM701, and look forward to collaborating with his incredible team to advance a novel immune oncology agent that has the potential to target tumor-associated macrophages in the tumor microenvironment. We are excited by this novel myeloid target, and although this is very early days, we hope that through rigorous and deep research, we will build a strong foundation that can ultimately translate this very early stage program to a first-in-class clinical candidate. And while our progress in the clinic has been a major focus, we have been in parallel advancing programs like this one along with additional later stage programs to continue our science-driven approach to discover and develop novel immune oncology targets. We will continue to push the science forward and look forward to maturing these programs to a stage where we will be able to disclose more information in terms of target and our future strategic path. Investing in our early stage programs and pipeline growth engine remains high priority for Compugen, and we believe in the potential of our platform to uncover additional untapped novel immune oncology targets, just as we did with the DINAM axis. Finally, before turning the call over to Ari, I would like to thank the team at Compugen, our partners, investigators, shareholders, and patients. The dedication and contributions across these groups are what have enabled us to continue our on-track execution and progress despite the still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We are proud to have our prior guidance for enrollment and data across our studies unchanged. And with that, I will turn the call over to Ari to review our financials. Thank you, Anat. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Our financial results for the first quarter of 2021, released this morning, continue to reflect a solid financial position with, as expected, increased research and development expenses due to our growing number of clinical trials. Research and development expenses for the first quarter of 2021 were $7.3 million, compared with $4.7 million for the same period in 2020. This increase is attributed mostly to CMC-related activities, specifically manufacturing costs for additional drug supply of COM701 to support the planned expansion of our various clinical trials, as well as expanded clinical team located in the U.S., which brings additional expertise to the company to ensure the successful management and execution of our ongoing and soon to be initiated clinical trials. As a reminder, our clinical expenses reflect costs associated with our expanded clinical programs, which will now include COM701 in monotherapy, dual and triple combination studies, as well as dose escalation study for COM902. Net loss for the first quarter of 2021 was $9.9 million or 12 cents per basic in diluted chair, compared with a net loss of $7.1 million or 10 cents per basic in diluted chair for the same period in 2020. As of March 31st, 2021, we had approximately $190 million in cash and cash-related accounts, compared with approximately $124 million as of December 31st, 2020. The company has no debt. The decrease in our cash balances of approximately $5 million net during the first quarter represent approximately $9 million of gross cash expenditures offset by collection of $2 million from AstraZeneca related to the revenues recognized in the fourth quarter of last year and $2 million of working capital. As a reminder, we expect our gross cash expenditures for 2021 to be in the range between 40 to $42 million without taking into consideration any potential cash inflows for the company from existing old and new collaborations. 
Thank you. And with that, we will now open the call for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star 1. If you wish to decline from the polling process, please press star 2. If you are using speaker equipment, kindly lift the headset before pressing the numbers. Please stand by while we poll for your questions. The first question is from Mark Breidenbach of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Hey, hey guys, uh, congrats on all the progress and, and I hope everyone is staying safe on your end. Um, uh, just um, a, a couple from me. Um, first of all, should we um, be expecting any additional patients from either the monotherapy or nivolumab combination cohorts to be included in the analysis uh, presented at ASCO uh, versus what we saw in February, or will it, will it really just be the same set with, with more uh, follow-up time? And, and um, you, you mentioned that there might be some, some correlative data presented uh, at, at ASCO as well. I, I'm wondering if you were able to track any specific markers of DNAM1 activation, or will these correlative data really be more generalized indicators of, of immune activation and response? Um, so I will take the the correlative assessments and I'll let Henry relate to the to the clinical uh, on the correlative assessments. Uh, as we stated in our last uh, quarterly call, um, we were able to track v with very initial uh, uh, data, obviously, uh, immune activation seen by COM-71 treatment as monotherapy and also in combination with nivolumab. So uh, this data will be presented with respect to DNAM axis. Uh, this, uh, this is really... Um, analysis in progress, and uh, and if we we'll show some data, it will be very very initial. We will present the data as we will have it uh, uh, ready, um, probably in additional uh, later conference. Henry, uh, thank you. So, Mark, uh, what we previously disclosed uh, in February was a snapshot snapshot of the data. Uh, at ASCO, we'll present updated data, uh, including all the patients uh, who have been enrolled on the dose escalation arms of the study, so monotherapy, dose escalation, the combination dose escalation, including follow-up. We'll also disclose uh, data on uh, the patients who have been en enrolled on the monotherapy expansion cohorts, uh, including follow-up on those patients also. Uh, and particularly, uh, we will disclose data on long-term uh, patients who have been on the study, and especially the ones that we've highlighted in the prior disclosure we had uh, in February. So it will be a summary of all the data that's been previously disclosed and new data, specifically new data in the last dose cohort of COM701 uh, in combination with nivolumab, uh, both at the doses of 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose and for 80 milligrams IVQ for weeks. So that will be a lot more of the safety data in those cohorts. All right, that, that's super helpful. Thanks for that. And, and um, just also wondering if you were able to collect any post-mortem biopsies uh, from patients in, in, in the phase one study who um, were, were, were on drug at the time of death, um, just to, to be able to look for any evidence of target engagement um, and, and also do a little bit of uh, PVRL2 expression profile in, in any of the um, phase one patients. Thanks for taking the question. Yes, uh, as Anat mentioned in our script, uh, there will be correlative data presented, and I'll give an opportunity to Anat to uh, further uh, expatiate uh, on your question. Yeah, I we were collecting on the monotherapy expansion. We're collecting a pre and on treatment. I am not sure with respect to post mortem. Um, I guess you'll need to wait for the. I, I'm I'm not sure that we have post mortem for a, for a specific patient. Okay, fair enough. All right, thank, thanks so much for taking the questions, and and we're looking forward to the ASCO presentation. Thank you, Mark. The next question is from Stefan Willy of Stifle. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe just to follow up on the last question, um, can you maybe just kind of ballpark with respect to, I guess, how much uh, pre and on treatment tumor biopsy data from from patients we might see at ASCO. And I know you talked about um, some of the peripheral blood markers of immune activation, but um, I think there's been some increased interest in, in the changes in CD8 till fraction that are in the tumor, you know, both pre and post treatment. So just wondering if, if, if that's an assessment that, that we might see at ASCO. Um, so, as you correctly stated, we did speak about uh, the blood markers, and and with respect to to liquid biopsies, we obviously have from uh, from the dose escalation as well as from the expansion. So here we have a little bit more. The number is a, is a little bit higher. Um, on the uh, on the tumor biopsies, um, as you remember, we had. 20 patients in the monotherapy expansion. Obviously, we couldn't get biopsies from all of them as paired, uh, pre and on treatment. So it's a, it's only a portion of this uh, of this uh, uh, group. And uh, taking into consideration that uh, uh, that uh, in some of them, obviously, we didn't see response. So I think that the data will be uh, limited. It's initial. Um, the data that we have is uh, is pointing to some preliminary, as we stated, preliminary uh, um, activation upon COM71 treatment. Um, what we're going to present uh, will probably not be all the immunohistochemistry data because this is in in, in progress. We will present some of the data that uh, that we have. So just to address your question, it will be limited at this point in time, but we will make sure that we present all the data when we have it, probably in a later conference. Okay, that's actually uh, quite helpful. And then maybe just to throw a question at you that we're getting a lot. I know that there's um, a competitive trial readout, I think coming maybe later this quarter. and one of the backbone agents in that in that regimen that's being evaluated is a is an FC silent digit. So just kind of wondering, you know, what you're maybe expecting to see out of that and I guess, you know, how you think that data might extrapolate out to what you're pursuing with, with 902 right now. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a fair question that, you know, that would be the first uh, data that is uh, derived from an FC inactive uh, TGT inhibitor as opposed to the rest of the data that is out there. So obviously we're looking as well to see what the data will uh, tell us. I guess that you... Uh, uh, are well familiar, and uh, not only you, Steve, but also the the community with our view about the uh, the need or um, or actually the no need for from our perspective, as we see it based on our data, on uh, having an FC active. Um, we hope this will uh, this will support this uh, uh, this view that we have. Which is based on which is based on data. We recently published a Com902 a paper on Com902, uh, which is further strengthening what uh, what we're uh, saying for quite some time. Um, we have our own Com902 uh, clinical study. This is now in dose escalation. We promised to show data in Q4. So obviously our data will be outside as well. Um, so. We're, we're looking to see what the data will tell us uh, from the other company, but also we're uh, looking very carefully at our data as well. And uh, we still didn't find uh, uh, in the public domain a reason to be uh, concerned with our view with respect to FC inactive uh, uh, performance in clinical studies. So we'll see. All right. I appreciate the answer, and uh, congrats on the progress. Thank you. The next question is from Dana Graybosch of SV 
B. Leerink. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the question. Uh, a couple on the science side. Uh, I think we're seeing more companies talk about targeting tactile or CD96, the sort of the, the other member that you don't have a program against and sort of the DNM access. And I wonder if uh, the first question, and then I'll have a follow-up, but the first is, what do you think about CD96 uh, and its role in DNM signaling um, and whether you may need to target it in some patients or tumors as well? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, CD96 actually is a, is a binding PVR, but it binds PVR with a lower affinity than than digit. So we think that the you know the contribution is uh, uh, is not really clear. Definitely, PVRID is addressing a completely different node, which is a PVRID PVRL2. We believe that the PVRID uh, uh, PVRL2 and TGIT PVR. Um, are the two pathways that needed to be blocked in order to generate a um, meaningful uh, um, anti-tumor activity. I'll say that uh, also the, um, whether CD96 is a positive co-stimulatory or negative co-stimulatory, that's also, that's also a question, at least, uh, you know, at least in, in our hands and, uh, and in some papers outside. So we'll see. We'll wait and see. But it doesn't change our hypothesis. Got it. And then a, a follow-up on the question that Stephen just asked on the competitor data. I wonder if you can remind us how similar are COM902 with Arcus's digit that's going to have the data. Any, any notable differences in addition to the similarity that we should consider when looking at that data? Um, so... First, with respect, our, our antibody is IgG4. I believe theirs is IgG1 mutated, uh, but still FC inactive. Um, and uh, and in general, our antibody is a, a ultra high affinity antibody. Um, that's an antibody that we've uh, uh, developed from day one to be complementary with the uh, with COM701. Um, and uh, we tested it also benchmarked to other TGT antibodies. We don't have a, a, a reason to believe that uh, epitopes would play a role here, different epitopes, like, you know, similarly to, to PD-1. Uh, but generally, the difference is the high, the ultra-high affinity with respect to our antibody. So we'll see. Helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Ren Benjamin of JMP Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, uh, Anat, you mentioned the uh, uh, the additional data in the fourth quarter of this year. Can you give us a sense as to how many per patients' worth of data we might be um, seeing for both studies, uh, and, and would it be enough? to, um, you know, make some reasonable conclusions about a path uh, forward. Um, Henry, would you like to address this question? Sure. Uh, so the two, uh, Ren, uh, so the two uh, key uh, projected data that will, will be anticipated will be for the TGIT antibody, like um, uh, Anat uh, mentioned, COM902. Um, so for that, as you know, uh, Rennie, uh, it's, a, it's a design uh, that has uh, an accelerated portion to it. So we have single safe subject patient cohort, uh, and also we have a three plus three uh, subject dose level cohort. Um, I, I cannot project for you now the total number of patients that we will, we will expect to see, uh, but certainly uh, it will be at least more than four patients that will, will, will enroll because we'll go past the single subject dose level cohort. Uh, we're continuing to accumulate uh, data on that study. So uh, maybe uh, at another uh, presentation, we'll be able to uh, hone in more on the absolute number of um, uh, patients that we're projecting. Yeah? Got it. And then the triple comment? Yes. So for the triple combination, uh, we also have uh, that uh, ongoing 
Uh, it's a three plus three study design also. Uh, the projection when we started that uh, dose escalation study uh, is to go as high as uh, 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose uh, with COM701 in combination uh, with the other uh, two agents. So the other two agents are the BMS 986207, the uh, BMS digit antibody, uh, and uh, nivolumab. Um, we, so far, uh, as we keep on, we're on track uh, at a later uh, at the teleconference, I uh, will be able to tell you how many patients we we'll expect. Uh, but uh, certainly, the reason we're projecting that we'll get up to 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose of COM, uh, COM 701 in combination with the other two agents is because, as you remember, um, the dose that we've recommended for expansion uh, for COM 701 uh, is the 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose IVQ four weeks. So uh, as we uh, go along, we'll be able to further refine how many patients that will pro will pre present at that uh, at that time. Got it. Okay. And then just you know regarding the the biomarker <clears throat> data that that you'll be disclosing at ASCO as well as you know later on in the year. Um, it seems to me that ultimately you are probably are in search of um, a patient signature or some sort of signature that might, um, uh, you know, allow you to identify patients uh, that would respond, right, to, you know, either 701 or the combination of 701 and 902. Am I thinking about that correctly, that, that ultimately all these analyses um, will help you to um, – uh, identify, you know, the patients better, or uh, are you looking at these data more to boost the current, um, you know, uh, clinical benefit rates that you're seeing uh, to more of uh, objective responses? Uh, or do you kind of feel that, you know, SDs right now are, are, are pretty good, and if you can get more people, you know, with stable diseases, that would be just fine? Actually, actually, both, and also for better understanding the mechanism of action of uh, COM-701 uh, treatment. Uh, uh, the biomarker strategy is broad enough in order to uh, address uh, um, tumor biopsies and, uh, and also information gathered from blood samples, uh, we, have the, we have the component of the retrospective analysis, and you also know that we have the component of patient selection uh, basket study in the triplet. Uh, we are looking to understand what the tumors are telling us following COM-701 treatment, monotherapy or combination, um, and whatever we can get to better understand what's going on in, in uh, in a tumor macroenvironment remodeling, et cetera. So both uh, goals that you mentioned, but also better understand the mechanism of action. Got it. Um, I guess just one final question for me. I'd love to just kind of get your thoughts on the on the TIGIT landscape as you see it right now, how, how it's unfolded with, with the data that we've seen to date um, and kind of, you know, um, how 902 might be able to sort of thread the needle in the in the space. I'll let Henry address it, but uh, I'll just say that, you know, currently the, the TIGIT studies that are ongoing across the different indications are mostly PDL1 high. Uh, as we stated for quite some time, we believe that PVRIG will be, uh, targeting PVRIG will be complementary, and you can see that our clinical strategy is addressing the more the PDL1 low and non responsive uh, patient population. Uh, with our digit, obviously, the key differentiating factor is the fact that we can combine it with COM701. Uh, but I'll let uh, Henry address uh, more the landscape and our strategy with COM902. Yeah, thank you, Anat. Uh, so, Reni, I, I think what's key here is that uh, this uh, provides opportunities uh, for better treatment options for patients who have advanced disease. Uh, most of the data that's been presented prior to the release uh, or by Rose Genentech uh, was those escalation uh, by Uncle, Uncle Med Mario. Uh, now we have more data. Uh, 
uh, from uh, Roche Genentech. Uh, and like Anat alluded to, uh, this is more robust data because it's a randomized study in non-small cell lung cancer, and it appears that the activity of the combination of um, uh, their TGIT uh, plus the PDL1 inhibitor is better uh, enhanced uh, in patients who have high uh, PDL1 uh, expression. Okay. Uh, the data from Merck also uh, shows that the combination appears better. Uh, in combination, uh, better results in combination with a PD-1 inhibitor. So that's good for patients. Uh, what is currently unknown at this time, I don't think, personally speaking as an oncologist and looking at all the data that's been there, uh, is whether there will be an impact with the kind of FC that one has. Um, we're looking forward to data disclosures by uh, ARCUS as they've uh, iterated that they will have an interim analysis of their data. But we believe, like uh, Anat has mentioned, uh, that COM902 uh, will have uh, anti-tumor activity and that it will, as a pure blocker, um, that it will which will show, uh, based on the science, uh, that there will be, should be no difference in terms of whether there is an FC enhanced or non-FC enhanced. However, this data are all that we're collecting, uh, all ongoing, and we'll see what uh, ARCOS presents also. Uh, I'd just like to add that uh, Anat, uh, I completely align with what Anat has said, that what actually differentiates Computen is that we are going to be testing a PD-1 and a PD-L1 free regimen, where it will be the combination of COM902 with COM701, and we'll see what the uh, preliminary safety, uh, tolerability, and anti-tumor activity uh, of the combination will be. But also remember that we have a triple combination study that's ongoing in collaboration with uh, BMS, obviously, where we're testing the DNAM hypothesis uh, of complete inhibition of the various aspects of, of, of the DNAM axis. So it's all incredible and uh, exciting data that we hope to see over the next uh, several months and before the end of the year. Uh, and hopefully this uh, will all lead to a clinical benefit for patients uh, who um, are desperately in need uh, of better treatment options. Terrific. Thanks very much for taking the questions. The next question is from Astika Kunwardini of Toost, of Toost Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, can I, I want to revisit something here. Uh, on the triple, um, can you tell me what dose level of COM701 that you will begin the escalation? I just want to clarify, are you starting that at a dose at, with uh, COM701 dose at 20 mg per kg or something uh, maybe uh, around that area? And then I have a, another question on the um, the more complete IHC data that you alluded that you'll uh, follow up with at a, at a later conference. Will that be something the second half of 2021 as well that we can expect? Thanks so much. Um, so I'll start with the IHC and then Henry will take the, the triplet uh, dose escalation question. Um, we did not share guidance, but as I said, this is in progress. Uh, hopefully, we can still present it this year, but uh, but we will give a specific guidance when we know more. Okay. All right. Thank you, Anat. So, uh, Astika, with regards to the triplet uh, combination, uh, what we've disclosed is that uh, we'll have approximately up to five dose level uh, sequential dose uh, escalation cohorts uh, in combination with fixed doses of the BMS TGIT antibody 98607 and nivolumab. Uh, so, inherently, that means that we will not be starting at 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose of COM701 in combination with the other two agents. Got it. Thanks, guys. The next question is from Roger Song of Jeffries. Please go ahead. 
Great. Um, yeah, uh, congrats on the on the progress. And uh, most of my questions related to similar one and now now two has been raised and answered, so I won't repeat. Maybe just a, a quick question related to the John Hopkins collaboration. So we know the myeloid target is one of the pillar of your computational discovery platform. Maybe could you just uh, um, um, provide some additional color in terms of the the nature of the uh, the um, the collaboration, um, and uh, maybe more specifically, what what are the steps and the timeline for the candidate nomination and the potential kind of IMD? Um, yes, yeah, sure. As much as we can uh, relate to it, we didn't disclose much, but I'll just say that the collaboration with Hopkins is uh, it's very similar to how we conduct the collaboration for uh, for a few years now. Uh, Hopkins is. Uh, is part of uh, executing the research on uh, on the candidates. Uh, as I stated, they were also part on, on some of the preclinical work on COM701. Uh, so this is the nature of the collaboration. Specifically for this, uh, for this uh, myeloid target, this is a very early stage one. Uh, it still merits uh, research in order to explore the therapeutic potential. Uh, we believe it's uh, um, it's exciting, and uh, as we disclosed, uh, uh, we have uh, we we've seen some tumor growth inhibition in uh, genetic depletion uh, uh, animal models. Um, the mechanism seems uh, interesting, but it requires uh, uh, a lot of research. And this is why we thought that this is uh, it would be good to go hand in hand with the uh, with the laboratory of Drupal Doll and his excellent team uh, that were used to work with them and and do the work together. Um, that's what I can say about this specific uh, drug target. Great. Uh, thanks for the color. Um, yeah, I won't leave Ari uh, and, uh, out of this conversation. Maybe. Ari, I believe you provide some kind of color around the OPEX and cash. Maybe just remind us so what is the current guidance around the cash room, right? Hey, Roger Schultz. So um, we ended the quarter with about $190 million. As we stated before, the yearly run rate for the, re the yearly band rate expenditures would be roughly between 40 to $42 million. So having said that, assuming we will not increase significantly the cash burn rate, we're talking about at least cash sufficient through the end of 2023. Having said that again, if we do decide based on our clinical strategy to expand uh, and to increase the, uh, the clinical trials, obviously this estimation might change. Great, thank you. That's all from me. Congrats again. Thank you. The next question is from Tony Butler of Ross Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks very much. Appreciate you working me in here. Uh, question, Annette and Henry, is around um, 701 and 902, the combination trial. Henry, you alluded to the fact that uh, for safety reasons, you would want to uh, see that combination, but don't you actually get that with the triple? And I guess outside of dosing, um, that is the amount that you would use optimally with 701 with the uh, optimal dose for 902. What else might you actually define, if anything, for um, the two, uh, for eliminating both co-inhibitors in the DNAM axis in the absence of a, of a PD-1 antibody? Yeah, uh, Tony, thank you for your, your question. Uh, remember that uh, in the process of doing a dose escalation study, uh, the intent is to uh, evaluate what the safety and tolerability of that combination that you're testing. So if you have three um, study drugs that you're combining as part of a dose escalation, it is impossible to be able to extricate what the contribution uh, to safety of either one of the components or two of the components are. So you can only uh, speak to what that combination uh, does in terms of safety and tolerability, uh, especially within the DLT window that, you're, uh, that you've assigned for the 
course of the dose escalation, and also intermediate and long-term toxicities, right? Now, uh, for the dual, so therefore, it will be not, it will not be possible uh, to allude uh, completely to what a TDIT inhibitor does uh, separately as part of a triple combination. And also remember that even though we get some data from what uh, the combination of a TDIT inhibitor does as part of that triplet combination of COM701 nivolumab, it's a different TDIT antibody. Um, so the TIGIT antibody that we're using in the triplet combination is the TIGIT antibody from uh, BMS uh, 986207. Um, it's not, it cannot, it, it's a separate entity itself, so it is. Uh, you cannot transfer the safety and tolerability of one uh, antibody and, uh, to the other. You can get an idea of what the relative uh, toxicity is, but you cannot transpose it to another uh, antibody. So therefore, uh, there is a need uh, since the two agents that will be combining, which are ours, COM701, we know the uh, safety and tolerability of COM701. As you remember, Tony, we started at 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose, and we've dose escalated uh, through 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight dose, IDQ for a week. So we have a lot of data on COM701. Uh, it's an unapproved agent. Um, so it's it's an antibody that we're still collecting data on, but we're relatively comfortable with what we see in terms of its preliminary anti-tumor activity and safety and tolerability. Uh, COM902 uh, is um, a, another new uh, agent. Uh, it's a ticket antibody, but remember that it has never been combined uh, with COM701, which is an another unapproved. So we have two unapproved agents. And as far as the regulations go and clinical practice and uh, uh, doing conducting clinical trials, you have to be able to compile the safety information of those two agents separately without any other agents um, in combination. So it just be the dual combination. Uh, the expectation is, because we know what the safety profile of COM701 is, very well tolerated. We do not expect to see anything that is um, out of the blue when we combine with COM902. But at any rate, that's why we're doing the clinical study. So even though the triplet will inform a little bit, it will still not be sufficient to uh, fulfill our regulatory obligations uh, with the combination of COM701 and COM902. I, I hope that answers your question. It does, Henry, and, and thank you for the clarity. And, and please understand, part of the rationale was, would you find other information outside of safety? But I think you've made it very, very clear what the goal is, and I appreciate it. This concludes our Q&A session. I will now turn the call back to Compugen's president and CEO, Dr. Chen Dayan. Would you like to make your concluding statements? Yes, thank you. Thank you all for joining the call today. 2021 is poised to be an important year for Compigen with meaningful milestones and multiple data readouts. We will continue to push forward as leaders in the DNAM Access space, advancing our wholly owned PVRIG and TIGIT assets to potentially drive cancer immunotherapy responses in, in new and expanded patient populations. Thank you for joining us today and your continued support. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. This concludes the Compugens Limited First Quarter 2021 Financial Result Conference Call. Thank you for your participation. You may go ahead and disconnect.